Well, good morning. My name is Pastor Jared, and we're so glad that you're here with us, worshiping online. And uh, now let's look at uh, the Word of God. We're going to continue today in our All In series, The Disciple Maker's Joy. This is part two of our series. I want to open today by asking a simple question. What is a disciple? This is a discipleship series. And before we do anything, we have to answer that question. What is a disciple? For some of you, you may have an answer already in your head about what that question or answer might be to that question. But for some of you, you may have never even heard that word disciple or you uh, really don't have any clue or haven't really thought about what that might mean. You do know that Jesus had 12 of these. He had 12 disciples, but we don't know what, what it actually means. But here's the deal. The truth is, it is a very profound question to ask. Because as you'll see today, it is the title that Jesus gives to those who follow him and the title of what those who follow him are to produce. Disciples make disciples. So we must define this. Now, if we don't define these things and we don't have clarity we are like a person who's lost in the wilderness or lost in the forest. When people get lost and they don't have something to guide them when they are lost, almost everyone will find themselves walking in circles. They'll think they're going straight. They'll think they'll go, they're going in a certain direction. And they will actually find themselves going right back to where they started. You see, they need to have a compass or they need to have the sun shining to see direction or be walking at night to see stars. They need something that's guiding them to make sure that they are walking in the correct direction to move them from being lost to being found. So it's important today that we define what is a disciple. Now, we find this command in Matthew 28. It's called the Great Commission where Jesus gives final instructions to his disciples as he's going up into glory. He says to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always even to the ends of the age. Jesus commands these disciples to go and make disciples. But it doesn't stop there because what would that new disciple then need to do? Jesus tells his disciples to go and make disciples. And if those disciples are to be like those disciples, they are to do what? You probably already got it. Go and make more disciples and on and on and on. But it wasn't just here in Matthew 28. We've got these, this name disciple and they are to make disciples. But for more ingredients on how to define what is a disciple, we need to go back, go back even further. Go back into Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy actually chapter 6 Deuteronomy is part of the Old Testament Torah, the first five books of Moses. And Deuteronomy, this portion is written as Israel is finishing their wandering in the wilderness after they were rescued from Egypt. Moses, God, God and Moses led them into the wilderness where they got the Ten Commandments and were getting instructions from the Lord on how to be His people and live this out in the world around them. And before they were to enter into the promised land, God had this important instruction in Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Israelites and the Jewish people refer to this passage of Scripture as the Shema. It's the great commandment from the Lord. To, to lead into this, starting in verse 1 of chapter 6, uh, Moses writes, These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy, and you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as you live. If you obey these decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel. And be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land 
flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. And now here is the Shema in chapter in verse 4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them on your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. Let's go ahead and pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you have given us everything we need in your word to define what it means for us to be your followers, to be disciples. Father, would you open our hearts and our minds to receiving that truth through this series? Lord, bring clarity to us that we would not wander, but we would be on purpose and on mission for who you've called us to be and how to bless and be a blessing to the world, Lord, we pray. We lift up Pastor John to you today. We pray for healing in him, Lord, and we pray that you would be at work in his difficult situation. We pray for his wife, Cindy, and their family as they make decisions moving forward and as they seek wisdom on how to care for him, Father. We pray for wisdom from doctors. Lord, we also lift up all those who have been affected by COVID in this past month. As people have been sick, we pray for healing in their bodies. We pray for wisdom as they care for themselves, as doctors care for people who are getting medical attention, Lord. In this trial, we look to you and we need you. But Father, in the midst of any of these circumstances, you have purpose for us as your disciples. And we ask that you would reveal that to us now in your word. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. All right, so let's look at this command. This is what we're going to break down in our sermon today. In looking at what God is commanding Israel to do, The question is, what is the lifestyle of a person who follows the Lord? Well, it starts, as he said, listen, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is alone. The Lord is one. You must love the Lord your God. That is the first commandment, to love God. Jesus reiterates this in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Um, He's asked by the religious leaders, Teacher, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6 now. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based in these two commandments. As you continue through chapter 6 of Deuteronomy and, and so on throughout the book, God is fleshing out specifics to what it means to love him. And Jesus adds in here to love God and also to love others. But the reason Jesus can boil all of this down, all of the Old Testament, all of the the demands of the prophets, that all of it could be boiled down to love God and love others is because if you are able to do that, it's exposing and it's showing the motivation of your heart. As we talked about last week, is your heart motivated by love? If your heart is motivated by love, you will love God and you will love others. And Jesus also says, if you love me, you will do what I command. That is how you love God. Love me by obeying me. And part of obeying me is loving others. And every other part of your life, all the other parts, if you love me and if your heart is motivated by love, everything else will find its place. It'll work its way out in every part of your life. Because the rest of the law just practically gives explanation to how this is to look like in our family, in our work, 
with our finances, with our relationships, in the marketplace, with our worship of God and our relationship with Him. When you have your heart right, everything follows. Your attitude follows and your actions follow. So we are to love God. We are to love others. Those are the first defining things of being a disciple of Jesus. But second, in order to love God, it must be done with our whole heart, with our soul, with our mind, with our strength. With our entire self, we are to carry out that commandment. We are to give every part of who we are and use it all for loving Him and for loving others. You see, this is why this series is called All In, because a true disciple of Jesus is all in. Every part of who they are, every part of their life is given to the glory of God, to loving Him, to loving others. He's looking for followers who are going to hand over their life to Him. When I was a student in high school, I remember going to a specific conference with my youth group. And it was a normal weekend conference, so Sunday morning is the take-home message. It's the, the speaker was speaking on everything we've learned. You've been impacted. You have learned new things. You have been changed and transformed and inspired this weekend. Now, how do you take all this wonderful stuff from this weekend and bring it home with you Monday to school and to the rest of your life? And so to illustrate this, he put up a pie up on the screen a pie chart, and it was broken up into chunks, and those chunks had the different parts of your life in the context of a student. You had school, you had sports, you had friends, you had your job, you had entertainment, and so on and so forth. You had your family. All of this was there. And his question to us from the stage was, how much of the pie does God have? Because he was compelling us to ask how much are you going to pray and read your Bible and engage your relationship with God? How much of this pie are you going to give to God in relationship to everything else? And he was trying to point out that if other pieces of your pie are large, that they are becoming idols or distracting you from your relationship with God. And in trying to make sense of all that and growing up, it finally dawned on me years later that that speaker actually had everything wrong. He was completely misguided in giving the, the illustration in that way. Because you see, God's not interested in just having a piece of our pie. You see, God wants that entire pie to be affected by Him. God wants to be in your school. He wants to be in your sports. He wants to affect how you deal with your finances, how you deal with your job, how you interact with your family, how you do your relationships. You see, you have your pie broken up of your life and God is, should be in all of it. That's why we can see an example of this in Mark chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 17. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commands since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. You see, Jesus isn't just looking for followers who are halfway in, part of the way in, interested. He's looking for followers who are all in, who are willing to give their lives over to him. You see, he wasn't going to be okay with this rich young ruler joining his band of disciples and receiving a phone call one, uh, one weekend as they were getting ready to go to say, you know, Jesus, um, this is the rich young ruler. Um, 
Uh, I know we have a missionary journey that we got some speaking and healing to do over at the Sea of Galilee. Um, but I just, I'm really sorry, but I got some work stuff that came up this weekend. It's really busy and I'm just not going to be able to make it this weekend. So um, I'm really sorry. You'll have to go on without me. I'll join you guys for the next one. <laughs> now that's silly, but this is the point. Jesus isn't interested in just haphazard, halfway disciples. No, that isn't even what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who is all the way in, who has given Jesus every part of who they are. He's given them their whole life. So we're to love God and to love others, and we're to do it with every part of who we are. But it doesn't just stop there. Because this is where disciples normally get stuck, where people who are trying to be disciples and Christians get stuck. This is where the final point of this disciple-making ingredient comes together to finish our definition and to give us clarity. We're not just to love God and love others and to do it with our lives. It doesn't just stop there. No, we're called to give it away to others, to teach others to do the same. And not just that, but we're to do it in all, to, the way we do it was to do it with all parts of our lives. Not just in the programming of our church, the events, the worship times, the Bible studies, the spiritual activities. You see, in, in Deuteronomy 6, this is verse 7, he, Moses writes, repeat these things again and again to your children, these commands of God to love God and to love others with your heart, soul, mind, strength, committing yourself to these commandments every day. He says, repeat them again and again unto your children. Talk about them when you are at home, when you are on the road, when you are going to bed, when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands. Write them on, the, on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You see, a disciple of Jesus loves him by obeying what he commands. To love God and to love others with that heart motivation, they are to live it out in all aspects of their normal daily life and give it away. It doesn't just stop with them. I am not just called to be a Jesus-loving, people-loving person who's striving to be the best version of that for my own life. It doesn't stop with me, and that's where Christians have fallen short. That's where the walking in circles has started. Because we've gotten that far, but we missed this last point. To give it away to others, to help others do the same. And we're to do it in the ordinary parts of our lives. He says, in the comings, in the goings, as you are walking and going throughout your life, during your meals, in the morning, at night, and you are to do these things to, he says, write them on your hands. That's to remind them of these good commands. To write it on your forehead so that others can see the good commands. And to write it on the doorposts of your house and your gates to secure and to stake your family and to stake your life on it. The Apostle Paul understood this so well. In the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4, uh, Paul writes this to the Corinthians. He says in verse 16, I urge you to imitate me. That's why I have sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you how I follow Christ Jesus, just as I teach in all the churches wherever I go. Paul says, I urge you to imitate me. But he's not sending himself to the Corinthians. He's sending a disciple of his to the Corinthians. They, in following the teaching and the way of life that Timothy has, they will then be imitating Paul. And Paul says many times, I'm imitating Christ. So Christ is the example. Paul is living out that example of Christ. He gave it away to Timothy so that Timothy could give it away to the Corinthians so that they would look like Paul who also looks like Christ and that they would then give it away and on and on and on this disciple making goes. So to recap this, being a disciple means that you first love God and you love others. And you do so so that it affects your whole life. You do it with your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And 
You are giving it away, teaching it to others that they would then do the same thing to give it away to others. That's a great definition. But the question is, how does it play out? What are the means by which we're to do this practically in our lives? To love God, to love others with our whole selves all in and giving it away in the ordinary life comings and goings to others that they would be able to do the same. But I want to circle back to the beginning of this message, back to Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission. These men, these women had lived life with Jesus. They had done meals. They had walked with him, the comings and goings, the good days, the bad days, the arguments, the laughter. They watched him teach and they watched him heal. They were at times sent out by Jesus to take what they had learned and to go and use it on their own and give it away to others as well. Jesus was doing life with them. We've heard this great commission read. I read at the beginning, and many of you have heard this before. But what was was being heard, do you think, by these people who lived three and a half years closely in relationship with Jesus, in real life with him? A friend of mine, Bill Allison, wrote a book called The Disciple-Making Genius of Jesus. And he rewords this in a poetic rewriting that I think can help to amplify and to open up the scripture for us in in a better way. He says, You know the friendship I've shared with you for the last three and a half years. Repeat that in the exact same way over and over again, starting right now. Go and do exactly what I did with you with other friends and help them to do it with their friends without ever stopping. When you tell others in your life about me, some will believe and follow me. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be sure to pull them close like I did, Jesus, like I did with you. And show them how to love God, to love people, and to make disciples who make disciples until every community in the world has disciple-making friends. As you live my disciple-making way of life, you can have full assurance of my presence, power, and provision, for I am with you. You see, we didn't live with Jesus, but these men and women did. They walked with him every single day. They lived life with him. And this rabbi, this friend of theirs who was now leaving them, was giving them instructions to look back at this experience that they had had with him. And he's saying, go and do as I did. That's what Jesus was calling them to do. We are to follow the example of Jesus' way of life. And the early Testament, the New Testament writers understood this well. In Ephesians 5.2, the Apostle Paul writes, Live a life filled with love following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, as a pleasing aroma. In Philippians 2.5, you must have the same attitude Christ Jesus had. Colossians 2, 5-7, Paul writes to the Colossians, For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him. Let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. And Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.21, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering just as Christ suffered for you. He, Jesus, is your example. You must follow in his steps. So Christ is our example of how to live out Deuteronomy 6. How to live out being a disciple in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And what is that example? Well, Jesus had a couple of ingredients to this. He had friends. He calls the disciples his friends. He's in relationship with them. He lives life with them. But they aren't just friends because Jesus 
is discipling them. He is teaching them the ways of God. He is walking through the scriptures with them. He is showing them how to live life, um, how God has shown them how to do it, teaching them the spiritual things of what that looks like. And it is not either of those, just friendship and just discipling. He puts those together and he creates disciple-making friendships. All of this is done in the context of life together. So, the last question may be, all right, Jared, you're putting all this together now. To love God, to love others with all we are, to teach others to do the same in ordinary life, and to do it in this Jesus example of disciple-making friendships, life together. But again, how does this play out in our practical life? How do we do this? Give us the one, two, three of how to make this happen. And the simple answer to this is this. You don't need to make this happen. You're not responsible to generate these things because God is already doing it. God is the one who is drawing people into the desire of wanting to know him and wanting to follow him. You see, all we need to do is to be willing and to be attentive to seeing what God has already placed around us. Because God has already put these opportunities around you every single day. In this series, we will unpack a simple equation that Jesus gives us with ingredients, the what plus what plus what equals disciple-making friendships. But for this week, I want us to start by reflecting on what it means to follow and love Jesus in our lives, to examine our heart as it pertains to our love for Jesus and our love for others. Look at the motivation of your heart again. Read through John 14, 15, 16, and 17 from last week's message. Reflect on these good words of exposing what does the heart of a disciple look like. Pray on that this week. And I encourage us to look around ourselves this week. God has given us family, a spouse, children, grandchildren, extended family. He's, giving us, he's given us neighbors. He's given us co-workers. The opportunities for disciple-making friendships are already all around us. They're all just waiting for us. So the question is, can we pray this week the disciple-maker's prayer that God would open our eyes to seeing what he's already given us and move our hearts and our attitudes and our actions into a willingness to follow after him. That we would be able to pull these folks close into these disciple-making friendships that we will unpack through this series. So as we close today, let's close by praying together this disciple-maker's prayer that we prayed last week and we'll end together with this. Let's say this together. Heavenly Father, Thank you for giving me a disciple-making way of life in Christ Jesus. As I go through every part of this day, help me to love you and to love the people who cross my path, starting with my family. Don't let me miss the adventures you are sending my way to live and speak the good news about Jesus today. Draw my heart to you and to specific people you want me to pull close for Jesus-like disciple-making friendships. By your word and spirit, transform me into a follower of Jesus who loves you, loves people, and makes disciples who make more disciples ad infinitum. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me in the word of God today. And as we close, let's close by closing with a worship song together.